Hi there, quilty friends. I'm Susan Smith. You are in my studio, Stitched by Susan. Welcome to this edition of Live and Unscripted. These shows are aired the first and third Friday of every month, and I live stream a quilting project each time. They're different. They have different topics, and they're not really a lesson. They're just me working on a quilt, often a client or customer's quilt, talking through the process as I do it. So it might be thread choices. It might be dealing with wonky borders. It might be anything. Today, I thought I would give you a little bit of insight into how I work out a new freehand design. So freehand edge to edge work is what I particularly love. And I don't work with pantographs or digital designs as a rule. They're just out of my head. So I thought it would be fun today um, to just kind of show you a bit of that process and how I work out some of the details in it. So before we get started on that, got my fresh cup of coffee in hand. If you're interested in supporting this show, you can do that really easily by going to buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. There for as little as five bucks, you can make a one-time contribution or there is a membership option if you choose to go that way too. I sure appreciate it. I do love my steaming cup of coffee in the morning. That is for sure. A couple other places you can find me. I do have a podcast called Measure Twice, Cut Once, and Other Life Lessons Learned from Quilters. They are interview-based episodes, and I just talk with other quilters and occasionally other crafters. Some of their life story, what crafting has meant to them, those sorts of things. Easy listening while you're quilting. So Measure Twice, Cut Once, and you can find it at podcast.stitchedbysusan.com. Super easy. So I encourage you to like and subscribe uh, this channel. If you click the little bell, you will receive noti notifications whenever I'm going live. And I would love if you would share this also with your friends who you think might be interested in this style of quilting as well. So one last sip of coffee and we're going to get started. Ah, that is so very good. Alrighty. My long arm, which you can just see the corner of, her name is Lucy. I'm stitching on a Gamel Elevate with a 26 inch throat. And we're going to start right from the loading process. <clears throat> Let me just grab my red snappers. I do use the red snapper system. And what that means is that I've got a little of this same red material. There's a little rod or peg that runs through the hem of my leader. And then I'm able to snap this right on top of it. And it's a really fast loading method that I absolutely love. Get my things out of the way here. So I'm just lining up the straight edge of my fabric. My front edge really needs to be straight. The other edges don't matter as much. Lining that up with my hem. And I happen to have a selvage here so I know that it is straight and just snap it in place. It's just that easy. And I'm working on a fairly small quilt today so that there's time to talk about the quilting design and not a whole, whole lot of quilting that has to get done. Dave's telling me I'm breathing hard. Sorry about that. <laughs> so I'm just walking around to the other side of Lucy and pulling my fabric across. Now this is how I avoid having to have squared up my backing is I have that front edge perfectly straight and when I pull this fabric over, I make sure that it is smooth. It is not pulled to one side or the other. Can you see how when I pull it, I start to get ripples? And then I know it's not straight, adjust that so that it's going straight over this roller. And then when I come back around and roll it up, it just pulls on beautifully straight. So if my sides are not perfectly straight, it doesn't matter. If my fourth side that's coming up against the leader is not perfectly straight, that doesn't matter either. The excess will just extend past the leader. In today's case, I have a selvage on both the top and bottom, so it is nice and straight. And I know I tend to huff and puff when I'm doing this side. It does take a little bit of pressure to pull the red snappers on. I got a comment on a YouTube episode um, a couple days ago, and the lady was asking, you know, is there a real learning curve to using the red snappers? And I don't think there is. It's a pretty simple process. 
but it does require some hand strength. And of course, I've done it hundreds of times, so you know, it might not be quite as quick for you the first time, but it is not difficult. My favorite method of loading. So just like that, I have a backing, nice and straight and smooth, ready to go. Here's my batting. Today I'm using my favorite, Hobbs 8020. Does it matter which side I go to, Dave? Because I could be really efficient with my fabric and go to one side. I'm going to work this way a bit. There we go. So Hobbs 8020 is 80% cotton, 20% poly. It's kind of a mid loft batting and it's quite durable, washable, has a very small amount of shrinkage. It is just my favorite all purpose batting. And then the quilt that we're working on is a little tiny Irish chain. Isn't that cute? My friend Pris sewed this quilt. I've talked to you about her before. I know I have. She makes a lot of small baby quilts and donates them to her local NICU. And they're quite small because they're intended for very small babies, kind of for play mats. So they're only about 36 to 40 inches as a rule. Now here comes the fun part. I'm trying to decide should we baste or talk about quilting first. Let's baste first. Bringing Lucy on, I'm just going to lower that back roller. I see that it's above my long arm quite a bit and I'll get a lot of bouncing if I proceed like that. So that, if you can see, this is where if, if my roller is quite high and there's a lot of clearance under here, that's when I'll get bouncing when I'm quilting. So I've lowered it till there's only hmm, three quarters of an inch or so between the roller and my long arm itself. I, I do need my glasses for this. Oh, I see the first technical difficulty is happening. Bear with us. We'll get it squared up. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the basting today. You're, you can just watch over my shoulder as I do it. And we're going to get on to working with my new design. So that's kind of the focus of today. But very simply, I'm just basting around three sides of the quilt with within the seam allowance area so that it doesn't have to be undone at the end. This just stabilizes all the edges of the quilt. And I am doing this by eye, but because I can see the big picture, I am constantly gauging the straightness of my quilt against the leaders at the top, against the rail at the bottom. If you're not comfortable doing it by eye, by all means, feel free to take the time to pin. But for me, and especially for a quilt this small, I can do it pretty easily by the seat of my pants, so to speak. So that is left, right, and top all in place. And then the last step is to put our magnetic bars on the front to hold the fourth side firmly in place. And now I have a quilting area that is stable and is not going to move anywhere. I'll go ahead and put my stretchers on the sides as well. These two are the Red Snapper brand. I like them because they have a long, you may be able to see better when I get to the other side. They have a long coverage, long reach on the edge of the quilt. Can we see this side? Sure can. Hmm, no, can't really. <laughs> there we are. We're gonna get a better picture for you guys. There we go. I'm sorry. This is what I like about them. They're long. So they're putting even tension on a whole bunch of my quilt, as opposed to having one clamp here and one clamp here. So if you've got another brand in mind or have another brand, that's totally fine. It's not the Red Snapper brand that I'm necessarily attached to, but that long grasp, that's what I love. And then my tension from side to side is very gentle, just enough to keep the quilt from being able to shift. It's not stretched taut like a drum. And lastly, you can see my yardstick. There you go. 
which I'm just putting under the strap to hold this clamp up just a little bit so that it's not sagging down and my long arm is not bumping against this clamping apparatus as I quilt. All right, that is all set. We're on to the fun part. Okay, we're going to do an overhead view so that you guys can see what I'm doing, hopefully. And what I've got here is a plexiglass sheet. It is 18 inches by 24. That works well in the size of my long arm. And I absolutely find these invaluable for trying out designs, for trying out sizes or scale or getting my, you know, stitching path back in my memory if I haven't done a particular design for a long time. I love these things. Something that's really important is that you have an edging on them. So we have put duct tape along the edge and the, the tape is on the top side. So number one, I can't inadvertently draw off with my marker. And number two, I always know which side is up because there is some marker residue on here. So I would never want to, you know, flip it and use it both ways. So the clean side is always against the quilt. Okay, we were just conversing about the possibility of turning the camera upside down, but I think this is going to work just fine because it's not particularly directional what I'm showing you. Where is the best place to zoom in? I think we need a close up with the GoPro camera for a second, Dave. I'm going to show you guys a particular fabric that is my inspiration today. Um, this one right here. Okay. Can you see the flowers on there? Can I find one that's more whole? Not really. Can you see this one here? This way? You're, you're getting a pretty good picture of it, I feel like. Um, here's one more. All the way, there we go. This one you can see. So this, this flower here is my inspiration for today's design. And so we're just going to kind of work through the thread path for doing it and some of the things that I'm going to choose to do because I was kind of playing with this yesterday and some of the things that I'm choosing not to do. So for starters, I've made things really simple for myself by deciding that I'm going to do a um, just a simple loopy meander between so this kind of idea to to be my connector there certainly are other things that could be done but for the for simplicity's purposes today so let's think about this flower and this motif and here's how i'm going to approach it i'm going to come into it by the stem and i'm going to put the little is it called a sepal you guys might know if someone knows tell me what it is the little kind of turned back areas that held the bud originally and then in my first rendition, I went right into the petals. So I kind of did this wobbly petal design, very casual. It's not going to be anything too difficult to quilt. And then off again into the next flower. But then I thought, this is an area I don't love. So this is how my head works when I'm thinking of a design. I'm thinking, what's that going to look like in thread? And I feel like there are so many lines converging right in here that I'm apt to get a distorted area of the quilt just because there's so much quilting. Also, it's going to be difficult to make them all converge where I want them, right? So then I'm thinking, well, how could I make that a little different? And when I look back at the flower, uh, it's not easy for me to go back and forth for you guys to see it. Where can I park Lucy that you can see one? I really can't. I'm sorry. When I look back at the flower, Here's another version, and this is what I'm going to try. So approaching by the stem, the same little sepal part, but then there's an inner almost scalloped bit, and then the petals go out from there. And do you see how that has just alleviated quite a lot of the lines that were right at this point? So that's one of the things that I think of when I'm thinking of a new design. How will it look in thread? And is there a way I could make it smoother, more graceful, or avoid problem areas like that? What else do I want to cover? 
one other thing, and I'm going to erase this because I thought this quilt was a great one for showing examples because it's got these lovely clear spaces you can see. Here's one other thing. When you're moving around a quilt top, sometimes you'll have a small corner and there's not room for that whole big flower, right? So how can you do a smaller one? Well, here's one idea and you'll see me employing this today as I quilt. So my same little sepals, my same little scallop, and it's very sketchy. Believe me, I quilt better than I draw. But what about instead of doing that big scallop, what about I make it much smaller? And what about it just has two petals and it's just a, like a not fully opened flower. Again, my drawing is terrible. I apologize for that, but you get the idea. I've just got in the back of my mind, a thought for something I can do that is quite a bit smaller. And then one last thing that I've thought of for even smaller areas is literally just putting in a leaf. A really simple leaf like that and then going on again into my quilting. So when there's really tiny areas, I'll put a leaf in. And I think that's it for my demo on that. So, you know, it's not a huge lesson, but I hope some of those tips will be helpful to you when you want to quilt something that's in the fabric of your quilt and you want to convert it to a stitching path. That's kind of how I approach it. So we'll do the first one on a nice big uh, white area here, cream colored area so you can see it. And I am also stitching it quite a bit smaller than I drew it out just because that was, I felt like disproportionately big. And there's my flower. It is, after all, a baby quilt. I don't necessarily want big 8-inch flowers on it. Now, something else you could do if you're not comfortable just winging it the way that I am is you could take some type of marking pen, like this, some type of air erasable pen, and you could literally drop in where you think flowers ought to be placed. I know you can't really see my hand. Um, but every so many inches, I'm going to put a flower every, at least every 12 inches, but you could jot in a little circle or a little marking, or you could even do a larger circle that would allow for the whole flower inside it to kind of gauge your placement before you start quilting. But because it's who I am, I'm going to wing it. And then one other thing that I will try and do is vary the directions of my flowers. so that some of them point east and some of them point west, etc. And they're pretty casual, so it's not very threatening quilting, let me tell you. I chose a thread that is a shade or two deeper than my cream, than the cream background of this quilt, partly because the backing has a very deep cream um, feel to it, and so I thought that would tie in well. Uh, let me see here. I have to pause and think which direction I'm going. There we go.
And as always, I will post some good photographs of this in the next couple of days so that you can get a good look at it close up. I'll make sure to include one of the flower that was the inspiration, as well as my resulting. Do you see what I did there? We're going to make a bud. So I'll show you what I did. My needle's in it. Can we see okay? My sepals should have gone that way so that my flower could extend this way because my stem is here. How can I put petals up there, right? So I'm not really one for undoing. I'm much more about winging it. So I just made a little bud, basically, more or less. We'll put another little uh, indicator in there and off we go into the next flower. And in order to make that not look like an oops, I'll kind of keep it in the back of my mind and I will do one or two more of them throughout the quilt. Now this time let's get it right. Definitely no shame in pausing to make sure that you know where you're heading. For me, I pause even oftener when it's a new design like this because it hasn't become, you know, automatic yet. Now. There we go. And I'm going to tell you another trick. I'm near to the edge of my area to quilt here and I would have exited out this side, but I see that that's going to give me a bit of a problem getting around my flower. So I'm just going to track right through it and exit out the other side and it'll be just fine. Once again, Remember, Susan, the sepal is always on the stem where you've already stitched. That shouldn't be so hard, should it? Here again, I'm going to go ahead and exit out the other side. That's kind of the beauty of freestyling your quilting. You're the boss of it. You can make those decisions or changes or adjustments as you go. Here again, out the other side. And there we are at the edge and I'm just gonna go ahead and travel within my basting line. I will take all my holding apparatuses, apparati, what's the plural for apparatus? Anyway, I will take them all off and you guys chime in with any questions you have and I'll take a few comments and questions before I start the next pass.
Mr. Producer, does it matter where Lucy is? Okay, let me grab my coffee cup, folks. Get a couple sips in while we're talking. All right. Okay. So apparently there's been an ongoing conversation about the magnets. When you use your magnetic bars, you have taken your leader off that bar. No, Cindy, my leader is still on it. And I have always worked on gamma machines. So in listening to other people chat about this, I realized that some people's rollers have multiple rolls and layers on them, and then the magnets don't stick. For me, I've just got my backing, my batting, and my, my um, top on it. My leader is attached to a lower down bar. Does that make sense? So I don't have to take the leader off, but it's not going over top of this, and my quilt is not rolling up. This, in the gamble world, we call this the belly bar, and the quilt is just going over it but isn't wound up on it at all. I hope that helps. So it's not a very good answer for you. I would explore the possibility of loading your quilts in a different way. I don't know if it will work, but I know not all gamble owners load theirs the way that I do mine. In other words, they use something different for the backing or something different for the top roller. So maybe explore that. Maybe ask in some of the Facebook long arm groups for someone who has your brand and see if they have a good solution for that. Okay, long answer to a short question. <laughs> Joan, Susan, do you know the name or brand of the Ecru fabric? I do not, Joan. Looking at it, I would say it's something like snow. Um, it's more than an eggshell. It's a little creamier than that, but I don't know offhand. I'm sorry. Sylvia, my red snappers are still very stiff. And sadly, that is the case. It takes a while for them to loosen up. I suggest if you're having trouble getting them on, run a blow dryer over them or something warm to warm them up and soften them a little bit, or warm water. Vicki, I prefer to pin the front and red snapper to the back. I like to float using clips on the front so the snappers get too bulky on the front bar. I haven't had luck with the magnets. Yeah, and others are saying that too. And, and what I know is my machine and my brand. So you just have to explore that and ask other quilters. Lazar, clean side always against the quilt. I love that attention to detail. Absolutely. I definitely don't want any marker residue on my quilt top. Joan, I'm sewing string blocks while I watch and listen. My ears perk up when I hear Susan say, here's a tip. Dave, thanks for spending your good Friday with us. You know, when I planned this for my first, this is the third Friday of the month, I guess. I didn't even think of it, honestly, that it's good Friday, but many people watch this after the fact. So I thought those who come, come. Those who watch it later is fine. Lauren, do you have a cheat sheet for the hooks and swirls pattern from the previous show? I don't. I don't, Lauren. I'm sorry. Um, I don't know that I will publish one because it is so similar to one that Angela Walters teaches. So really, it's her design. It's her brainchild. She does have a YouTube um, tutorial about it from years ago, and it's really good. All her tutorials, of course, are great. So that would be one suggestion. So tap, how do you handle the situation of missing an area that you find after you've mo moved on to another area? If it's loops like this, I will usually just angle back in there and put some more loops in. Even if I cross over a stitching line, that won't be very visible. A big old unquilted area will be much more visible to the eye than crossing over a quilting line. That's my opinion. Annabelle, the oops flower bud is so smart. Yeah, I'm all about knowing what to do with oopses. Lori, where did you find your plexiglass sheet? Uh, we got them at our local hardware store. I do know that Amazon sells them too if your hardware store doesn't. But for us, we were actually able to have our store cut them to size for us. And then Dave was the one that put the duct tape on. And I've seen ladies put pretty duct tape on theirs too. You know, hot pink or something. So you might want to try that. Sue, the plural for apparatus is apparatus or apparatuses. Whew, that's a tongue twister, but good to know. Okay. One last sip. So the next step now is to um, reestablish my basting lines. And I left my needle down when I was advancing. I frequently do that. And so I'll just go ahead and continue on the right-hand side where I am. I just see a seam allowance buckled back. I'll straighten that out a minute. Here's a tip. This is for you, Joan. 
when you have a quilt like this that has quite a few seams along the edge, it's not uncommon for those seams to be coming open a little bit. So sometimes in my basting, I literally do a little bit of reverse stitching over them just to reinforce them. It costs me half a second, and if it helps the quilt stay together, yay. For those of you who are piecers, I strongly recommend either piecing your quilt with a short stitch length to prevent seams undoing like that on the edges or running what many quilters fondly call a victory lap, which is a line of stitching around the outside, just about an eighth of an inch in from the edge that just holds all those seams in place so that handling of the quilt top is not pulling them apart. Either way can be really helpful. This quilt does not have a ton of seams, but when you see, you know, piano key borders or something like that, and there's dozens and dozens of seams, each coming open a little bit, that can really mess with your borders. So again, putting my little stretchers on the left and the right with a little delicate tension going on. And I like to do my quilting in alternating directions. So my first pass, I went from my left to my right. So this pass, I'm going to start at my right and go to the left. It's just another safeguard against, you know, all your flowers kind of tilting in one direction or whatever design you happen to be working on. I feel like this is another great place for a bud. Can I remember which direction I did it in? Yes. Hopefully the viewers will interpret that as a bud and not just an oops. Now I've kind of backed myself in a corner. I'm going to make very small loops because I know I don't have very much clearance over here. We did it! The size of these loops are totally up to you. You could also do you know, plump and round loops. But in this case, I wanted them to be kind of tenderly. So the curve is more what catches the eye, honestly, than the loop itself. But that's entirely up to you. I'm struggling just a little bit with launching my flower a little bit too close to what came before and not leaving quite enough room for that first petal. So I'm just kind of talking to myself as I do this and trying to say, you know, remember for the next time. 
I know many quilters doodle more than I do and would work out problems like that, perhaps on their doodling pad. As you saw with me on the plexiglass board, I don't draw well at all. I don't sketch well. I would much rather be doing it on fabric. So I tend fairly quickly to work out my quilting path and then launch um, right into the quilting. It's just where I'm more comfortable. And you saw again, I got too close there. Of course, part of that is I'm talking too, but. That's just my personal preference. I can work out my problems better at the quilting machine than at the sketch pad. I feel like the original flower kind of had squared off corners and that's what I was aiming for, but I don't love the look of it. So I'm going to stop squaring them off. Some of you who are in this group are in my freehand quilting master class. And while I quilt, I'm just going to take the liberty of talking about that for just a few minutes. If you watch these live and unscripted episodes, you'll know by now that this style of freehand and freestyling quilting is what I love to do. So in my master class, I teach that. I teach over 30 specific designs for your repertoire, but I also endeavor to teach this process of working out the kinks and of thinking through a design and deciding you know what makes it work what's clicking what's not making changes making adjustments changing up designs devising variations on designs all those things so if you would like more information about it you can easily find that by going to my website which is stitchedbysusan.com and there's a class page which has tons more information about it I will be launching another session of that class um, in early summer. Not sure the exact dates yet. Over the next few weeks, if you're on my email list, you'll start to see information about it, workshops that may be related to it, that sort of thing. Okay, and we're on the left side, so we will park with needle down. And we just have one more small pass. I did tell you it was a little tiny quilt, and it is indeed. Let me just roll forward and get myself back in front of the quilt and then we'll take some comments and questions. I will just, Lucy's kind of in the way you guys, so let me just go ahead and baste. Oh, okay, that works too. Let me get my coffee cup, okay? It's really important to me. All right, questions. Might be easier with the glasses off, honestly. I can read better without them. Mr. Producer's lost. I don't see a question. <laughs> this is this is quite a collaborative process, and we don't always read each other's minds. We try. Lazare. Carnations, that's what your design reminds me of. You're absolutely right. And and one could certainly play that up and do much more even rippling on the edges of those petals. Absolutely. Dave, I'm not as flowery as you all. I see Yosemite Sam from the Bugs Bunny cartoons. Okay. Cartoon. I see Yosemite Sam nowhere. Oh, the mustache, the mustache. and the little stain. Okay, got it. Got it. You know, <laughs> whatever your eye sees. <laughs> Regina, I had a devil of a time getting those long edge clamps to stay on. Any tips, suggestions to share? Are you sure that you're getting your fabric into the little thin channel that's got a little rubberized gripper in it? Because yeah, there's kind of two channels, and the very slim one is the one that you need to be in. I don't have any trouble getting them. Like, if my fabric is straight and I can get it in there, I have no trouble having them hang on. So make sure you're in the right channel. Any more? 
<clears throat> Cheryl, I tried using the metal bars when I float my quilts, but I found the quilt clips from the Grace Company work very well for my machine, which is an Anova. Different companies sell those clips. And in fact, I saw a lady the other day who took batting cardboard tubes and cut it into chunks and opened one side and used them. So if you're in a pinch or you're waiting for them to come in because you've ordered them, you know, I'm all about frugal. And that's about as frugal as it comes. Christy, do you give yourself a visual indicator to your, remind yourself of your quilting boundaries, limited throat space? I don't usually, Christy, because I'm pretty familiar with it. But if that's something you need, by all means, lay a couple pins in, run a line of painter's tape to know where your boundaries are. I'm pretty familiar with mine. Sue, I recently quilted a quilt on my sit down and did the basting all around the outside and it really helped keep the, quir keep the quilt square at the end. Thanks for that tip. Yeah, I didn't know how that would work, honestly, at a sit down, but if it was helpful for you, great, great. Marcy, I'm a long arm quilter and I wish I had half the talent you have for free motion. I exclusively use my robotics because my brain and hands don't connect well enough for free motion. I mean, I, I will preface it by saying it probably is not for everyone. I knew early on that it was what I loved, but also I've done hundreds of quilts. So I have worked on that hand-eye coordination too, but it is what I love. So if you love robotics, you go. See, that's not for me. So each to their own. Christy, when figuring out the motif, do you ever feel paralyzed by those big blocks of white background? Nope. I just, I just dive in. Maybe because I don't know any better. <laughs> Debbie, between you and Miss Tiffany, it always mesmerizes me how creative your brains work to freehand these gorgeous designs. I've tried and tried to free motion quilt, but I get so confused so fast. I mean, it really is a matter of practice, Debbie. It really, really is. And in terms of where to start, and I do this in my master class, we start with a pretty simple design and then create variations for it so that you don't have to learn altogether new designs. And that really helps too, to get some, some choices under your belt. Vicki, your design is so pretty. I love the flowing loops. I still don't have the confidence to do free motion quilting. I've only done pantographs. Take the leap, take the leap, believe in yourself do a small quilt like this and notice how much better you get from the beginning of the quilt to the end of the quilt. Like it really is just all about practice. Barbara, did I see somewhere that you were doing a show and tell from your master class? I'm, you would have seen this in my newsletter. So it is later today. We're having a grad party for the most recent students in the master class and quilters are all invited. So in my newsletter, there's a link. It's a zoom meeting. There's a link to that. There's no fee. You can just come when you want to, go when you need to. Um, and they're just going to show off some of their work and some of their progress. And we're going to celebrate with them and clap and blow our party blowers and stuff like that. So it's April 15 for those who are watching later. If you're watching, you know, on April 16, you're, you're too late. You've missed the party. But. Okay, folks. Let's do this last little bit. So this time I stopped with my needle down on the left side. So again, I'm just going to continue on with my basting, making adjustments as needed to keep it straight and square. There are definitely times and places when I do more pinning or do more measuring. You know, it has to do with if there's any challenges in squaring it up or how big it is, but this is just a little tiny quilt. So it's pretty easy to just do by eye. I've got my channel lock on on a perfectly straight line and I'm just going to move it up a couple threads width. width. It's just so slim. Now we're catching it. And if you're not comfortable putting your fingers in there like I'm doing, I know it looks a little bit sketch, just put some pins in there first. It's a bit like chopping an onion. You absolutely need to know to keep your fingers down flat. Don't have your little tea finger in the air. Alrighty, there's our basting complete. 
And it's not necessarily a thing of beauty, and I don't worry about that because it's all hidden in the binding. But meantime, it really, really helps to keep things square. Okay, I'm remembering that one of you asked about the quilt that is behind me. So it's a great topic for while I finish up here. The quilt behind me was a challenge at my local machine quilting guild. And I think I did it in my second year of long arm quilting. I did not know what I didn't know, so I just dove in. And the challenge was this. Each person, each contestant, because it was a contest, uh, received in a blind draw a vintage quilt top. And most of them were uh, needed mending, needed cleaning, they were stained, etc. And each person was to clean theirs and to finish it in any way they saw fit. So what I received was this double wedding ring. And I wish I could show you the pictures of it early on. It was brown and stained and pretty dang ugly. But we had a good relationship and formed a really great friendship. And I named her Audrey. And she is one of my favorite quilts. And I learned so much quilting Audrey. So I've never been sorry. I really did bite off more than I could chew, but I've never been sorry because I just, I learned as I went. And Audrey, by the way, won second place in that particular competition. Here I am again, a little too close. Not gonna worry about it, just gonna shorten up the petal. One more bud in here. I feel like three buds on this little quilt is a good thing. I had mentioned early on that I was kind of keeping leaves in my back pocket as a small motif to tuck in here and there. But as it turns out, we've done pretty well moving around with just the loops. So I'm going to leave the leaves out, but I do like to have an idea in my head before I start a quilt of ways to get myself, you know, out of corners if I get painted in them, right? So that leaf was a thought in my head. As it turns out, I didn't need it. Always have to stop and think now, which way is my flower curving again? I'm seeing the carnations now too, and I'll do this again sometime and put even deeper lobes in those petals and see if I can get it looking even more like a carnation. I quite like the little curved back. Um, I still haven't determined what that word is. It's not stamens. I think it is sepals. I think that was right. Anyway, I'm quite liking that little look, a little graceful S curve. So I will remember that and see if I can use that in some more designs. This little bitty, he's cute. We're gonna do a smaller one here.
I'm going to just let that one look like it ran right off the side of the quilt. I think we'll just finish it with loops. And there we have it. Okay, folks, I will undo everything. Chance for you to ask any last questions that you have. Would you like Lucy move to the other end? That would be easier, wouldn't it be? Let's just scoot Lucy out of the way. I will post some photos for you guys with the inspiration flower and then the flower that I quilted. You can see what you think. You'll know right off the bat. It's definitely not an exact copy. It's just inspiration and, you know, much simplified to make the quilting path easier and all of that. But I hope you found that helpful to kind of see into my thought processes as I'm working out a design and see um, some of the ways that you can change it up to suit your quilting style or the look you want to achieve on your quilt. So more questions, comments? Lazar, did you say what color thread you're using? I guess I missed it. Sorry. I didn't really, I didn't give the name of it. It is a couple shades deeper than the cream of the background fabric. It's more into a very warm tan. And that is kind of because the background has that deeper um, ground in behind it, that deeper color. So it's just a little richer. Uh, Joan, why not pick a thread that blended into the backing? Uh, I did pick one. Do you mean the background like this? I'm assuming that's what you meant, Joan. And absolutely, I could have. And maybe even I should have. You know, sometimes you don't know until you start quilting what that overall look will be like. So the quilting is a little bit... You know, you see it a little bit because it is a different shade of thread. But I don't think either of those are wrong. That just is what look you want to achieve. And I am, by the way, using a 100% polyester thread. The brand is Isocord and it's a 40 weight thread. And I have that both top and bottom. Mike, I'm turning off my stitch regulator. Any starting point for stitch speed? Um, Mike, I'm not sure how machines are for brands like how they measure. Mine, I believe, is a percentage of the maximum speed of the machine. So I would start at maybe 25 or 30 on my machine, but that might be totally different on yours. So I think just experiment. Start low just to give yourself, you know, room to not get tensed up. But if you feel like you're pushing a wheelbarrow up a hill because it's going so slow, just gradually speed it up. Just play with that. It's so individual. Tiffany, I love to free motion. It seems I'm always doing the same thing to me, but I'm doing, as you said, a variation of designs often. Changing just one element can make a big difference. That is a really key point, Tiffany. You can, you know, have one design that you know how to quilt and you're super comfortable with, and you can just tweak little things in it, and it looks new and fresh. Regina, thank you. I have a tendency to FMQ in row-like areas. I'm noticing you quilt all over your space in all directions, short and long. I'm going to be trying this, getting myself out of my comfort zone. Yes, I do try to vary which direction I'm moving in. So it's not up and down and it's not left to right just to keep that organic look going on. Tammy, I'm basting my quilt down and kept hearing a noise I haven't heard from my machine. It took me a minute to realize it's Susan's machine in the background. Good one. <laughs> that would give you a turn, wouldn't it? And Vicki, what do you do for thread color if you have a solid dark backing and a lighter and mixed quilt top? Oh, that's always a toughie, Vicki. I mean, not knowing your exact details, I can't give you exact ideas, but I do make my 
top and bottom threads pretty close to each other because you do tend to see them through the needle holes. So grays are good choices, you know, and go shades lighter or darker, but I like my top and bottom thread to be not too far apart in terms of darkness or saturation. Dawn, what are the yardsticks for? They are just for holding up the straps that are bracing the side of my quilt. If those straps sag, then often my long arm as I'm moving it around will bump into them and clatter and sometimes they actually get in the way. Lizier, my shoulders hunch up just looking at you working this intently and yet so smoothly. I must remember to breathe. Yes, indeed, you must. And you know, what you guys don't see on camera is I do take fairly frequent breaks to actually do shoulder rolls and things like that to keep telling myself, loosen up, loosen up. It's really important. Terry, thanks so much for your guidance on how to create something unique. You're welcome. I hope it was helpful. And Sue, what time is the party today? It is at 5 o'clock Pacific PDT. That's Pacific Daylight Savings Time. Sue Donnelly, sometime in the future, could you chat about quilting an English paper piecing quilt? Anything different in approach? Sue, that is a great question. And I'm trying to think if I've ever quilted an English paper piecing quilt. And I think no. But I'm going to surmise that it would be similar to having seams pressed open in a quilt, right? Because seam allowances will go to both sides. So stitching in the ditch would mean you stitch to one side. I mean, edge to edge, it's not going to be a lot different. There's not going to be any bulkier seam allowances. But I'm not an expert in that. So there you have it. <laughs> My Kindle, what's your max speed? Let me just check that out, Mike. Hang on a sec. Thinking, thinking, 99. So that, I think that's why I thought that um, the speed on mine is a representation of, you know, the percentage of as fast as the machine will go. Charity, how high should the fabric be above your ruler plate? I'm having shredding problems and have tried everything. Needle thread retention. I mean, not very like my bar at the back of my machine, you can't quite see my hand there, is, you know, about three quarters of an inch above the throat of my machine, above the arm. So my fabric is resting against the throat plate gently. You've tried new needle, I gather. Try checking that your needle is the right size, that the eye of the needle is big enough for the thread that you're using. Um, websites like Superior Thread have lots and lots and lots of information about which needles and threads pair well together. I'm kind of stuck in a rut. I use the same brand of thread a lot and I use the same needles a lot. So I don't have a really broad experience there to help you. Tiffany's, I dance while quilting. Seems to keep me from getting tense. Good tunes while working helps. I totally agree. I love to crank the music up while I'm, while I'm working. Okay. Thanks so much for joining all of you. I sure appreciate it. Once again, first and third Friday of every month here, April does have a fifth Friday. So we are planning to be on air. Not exactly sure what we'll be doing. Sometimes on that fifth Friday, we just do something different. So first and third Friday of every, uh, of every month, nine o'clock AM Pacific time. We are always here 